Your lives. Everybody, thank you for joining us today on this Tuesday morning, August 25th, for the ACA Small Business Boot Camp and Resource Collective. I'm Robert Thiebel, the Small Business Ombudsman and Vice President of Small Business Services. And we're excited to have you here today. We want to start by thanking all of our community partners. We could not run these boot camp sessions without their expertise, their time, and their effort. Uh, they've been vital to the success of the boot camp thus far. The Small Business Boot Camp and Resource Collective is a tool that's designed to help prepare small businesses to work through the COVID crisis and return stronger than ever. It is a statewide initiative supported by all our community partners. And the boot camp, we're going to continue it on through September. And with that in mind, we've been doing the boot camp for many months now, and we have, we're on our 74th session today. <clears throat> um, all those previous sessions are recorded and are available on our website. Um, listed on the screen on this page. It's the same website you use to register for today's event. Uh, as you scroll down on that page, you'll find the, the archive sections and you can go by week and find all the previous sessions to go back and review uh, the sessions you may have missed or you want to go back and review because you enjoyed that session. Also, you'll find all of the resources from today's sessions on, uh, on that page as well once it is finished. Additionally, on our website there, you can find the Resource Collective. And the Resource Collective uh, provides these statewide resources that our community partners have put together. Um, we have them listed there, so they're easy to find. Uh, some of the examples of those resources are these guides uh, that have been put together by various um, organizations, uh, such as Safe Retail, Guidance for Retail, uh, Restaurant Guides, Manufacturing, uh, Construction, Salons. There's a lot of information uh, to help your business uh, based on your industry. So this week's sessions, we have paycheck protection yesterday. Uh, that is available on the website to review. Today is part two of the ABCs for business. So we're gonna talk about the business canvas model and business planning. And Friday, we've got a great marketing session on leveraging Instagram for your business. A note about Friday's session is it will not be recorded um, due to some licensing things. So please make sure you're on that session. Uh, it's going to be a live only session. So um, join us uh, at 9 a.m. on Friday as well. Just some quick updates on some of the programs that are available on the state. Uh, the Small Business Rent and Mortgage Relief Grant um, is available. It's being managed for the state by Local First Arizona. You've got the link there on the page. Maricopa County uh, Small Business Grant version 2.0 is now available. Um, that is being managed by the ArizonaFoundation.org. Uh, it's called the Arizona Community Foundation. And then the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program through the SBA is still available uh, for small businesses to take advantage of those programs. Also a quick reminder of the state's COVID-19 information and resource page, ArizonaTogether.org. Uh, please take a look at that if you have not. And then our small business, our COVID-19 small business or business resource page, not just small business, but business resource page. Uh, we keep this updated constantly and it provides information, guidance, support for all businesses out there related to COVID-19. So I wanna share with you some of the programs that the ACA offers and provides for businesses. We have our small business services and we can help support navigating through the SBA and the Small Business Development Centers now we can also connect you with SCORE, uh, who is helping us today, uh, or if you need some local banking contacts or some of the latest developments uh, regarding COVID-19 and, and other programs. Our workforce division can help support employers that are looking to hire uh, and grow their staff, or you, they have a lot of training programs and some federally funded training programs that can support your business and your business growth. And then our Arizona MEP, our Manufacturing Extension Partnership, so they are a great resource for manufacturers uh, throughout the state. Uh, if you are a manufacturer, um, please contact them. They, they have a great program. So a quick note for those that are looking to start a business or expand your business, we also have our small business checklist. That's an online interactive tool to help you go through the most commonly requested licensing and regulations uh, for local, state, and federal levels for your business um, and your industry. So with that, uh, I want to introduce Jay Gladney from SCORE. He's a certified SCORE mentor uh, for SCORE Greater Phoenix. And uh, 
And Jay, I'm gonna go ahead and turn the time over to you and uh, it is all yours. Okay, very good. What I'll do is uh, share a screen and get the slides up here. And what we want to talk about today, good morning to all of you who are online here. Uh, what I want to talk to you about today is uh, something called the business model canvas. Some of you may already be uh, familiar with this. Uh, it's a pretty standard tool that has been talked about significantly inside a number of the uh, training organizations out there. ASU, uh, ASU's business school, for example, is heavy on this, talks about this a good deal. Been around since, for about 10 years now, since about 20, uh, 2010. Uh, and uh, it's a great tool for a couple of reasons. One is I use it very heavily with uh, organizations, my clients who are starting up, but it also is a great tool to kind of go back and take a look to validate uh, how you should be conducting your business somewhat differently after there have been significant changes. And certainly under the current situation here, I think uh, all of us should be looking at how we're gonna do this business a little differently after uh, we are been going through the circumstances here with COVID-19. So let's first talk about plans. Uh, hey, real quick, Jay, can you put it in presentation mode so we can oh, see sorry the about that. I right. got that step. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> awesome, that was great. There we go, Thank thanks. You. Uh, so um, let's talk a little about plans and planning. Um, there are a couple of schools of thought out there about uh, pe how people get into the business world. And one of those says basically sort of the, the Nike theory of just do it. Just jump out there. You think you got something great. Uh, you're almost certain that if you get the, get the word out that this is available, your customers will show up. Uh, so they'll say, just don't bother with the plan, just go do it. Uh, the couple of things around that, you know, the, one of the issues is plans never execute the way that you expect they will. And that's absolutely true. Uh, the first quote there talking about battle plans, obviously is from the military. Uh, Steve Blanks sort of modified that a little bit uh, and indicates it works the same in business. And both of those correct. Uh, plans will certainly never execute quite the way that you thought they would. However, there is a reason why you want to plan. And these are a couple of quotes that are from very different people, but kind of illustrate why that is. Uh, my favorite is actually uh, General Dwight Eisenhower talking about the fact that plans themselves may be useless. That's actually a little overstated. But the second part of it is not and that is planning is essential. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about why that is as we go through the presentation. The other is from Yogi Berra. Uh, and some of you who might be younger might not be familiar with Yogi, uh, who had, had some has some really interesting sayings, but uh, some of them seem to not make sense. But quite frankly, when you look underneath, you'll find a kind of do. This one, again, is one of my favorites. If you don't know where you're going, you will end up someplace else. And what that doesn't say is usually that someplace else is not really where you wanna be. So the answer is yes, you definitely need to plan. Uh, what does it do for you? Several things that kind of goes through, disciplines your thinking, validates your problem and solution set. I'm not gonna read all of those. You can read them for, your, for yourselves. But the whole point is, and the, one of the most important parts of that is that last one, which it allows you to communicate to others uh, what it is your intent is with the organization, the business that you're putting together, uh, how you expect it to be successful. And of course, in certain situations, that's absolutely key. Whether you're talking to, to uh, someone that you expect may uh, finance and provide you capital, or even whether you're talking about talking to your employers, or employees rather, uh, and you're communicating to them what it is that you expect your business to be. Uh, that's both uh, informative and it is uh, inspirational to them 
that they understand and can execute better against their jobs so it fits into the plan for the overall business. So the traditional business plan uh, is one that you oftentimes will need when you're going for uh, capital financing. Uh, it is uh, usually 15, 20, 30 pages, uh, very much like a, uh, something you, you've written for a term paper in, in college, structured topics, paragraphs, you gotta have decent uh, English, all those kinds of things. Uh, the supporting financials are usually spreadsheets in that plan. Uh, something clearly that you may need, and we'll talk about where you need that, as opposed to what we're gonna talk about today. There are lots of templates available out there. Uh, we have one at SCORE, SBA has one. There's any number of others out there. Uh, they're all, quite frankly, about probably 90%, a 90% congruent in terms of the kinds of things that they ask for. Uh, and they definitely have their place in the world. But for my clients, I usually want to start them off with uh, an alternative approach that has uh, a lot of good uh, uh, factors to it that work well. This really sort of comes from the whole concept of lean planning, uh, which really comes from the software applications development world. And I'm going to show you what this looks like in a moment in terms of the, the structure itself. But you will, you will see that basically you wind up putting meaningful bullets or segment or sentence fragments into this plan. Uh, and it provides you a very visual relationship between the key elements of your business that, that help you to understand how one of those key elements essentially supports or, and, and uh, yeah, is linked with the other. Uh, now, if you don't need the traditional business plan, for example, for a bank that requires it for a, uh, for a loan, um, you can actually use this in, in lieu of the traditional business plan. Uh, it is, it's pretty quick, and you'll see when you kind of see what it looks like, that it is relatively, you can do this relatively quickly, but it's not really easy. You really have to seriously think about uh, and put in, in these, uh, the meaningful bullets, the key um, factors that go into why you're going to be going into business, what it is that you're actually delivering and to whom. And it is useful in identifying gaps in your strategy or knowledge of, uh, of what you're really going to be trying to do as a business entity. So let's talk for a moment about what a business model is. Uh, one of the best definitions out there is that it describes the rationale of how an organization creates, delivers, and captures value. And you can see here, this is circular. So it's a cycle. It usually starts with the product or service that you are uh, coming up with, or actually you can start with customers. Uh, you, you decide which customers are appropriate for those, or you decide what a particular customer set needs. And so those two are very closely linked. We'll talk about that when we get to the business model canvas itself. So it cycles through, of course, through the idea of how you're going to drive revenue into the business and what expenses you will have, which essentially gives you your profit margins uh, to be a successful business. You go through the whole idea of capturing uh, that, those dollars, and then you fold that back into creating the product and services. And as you can see, it's a cycle that goes through uh, in terms of how your business actually works. So business models. We'll give you a couple of examples here that are relevant, uh, first of all, to the Arizona market here. Uh, most of you are familiar with AJ's Fine Foods or Food City. Uh, they have very different business models to deliver effectively the same thing. They, they're both grocery stores, but their business models are based on the idea of delivering something a little different. So when you talk about value for AJ's Fine Foods, uh, you're really talking about a value proposition that is focused 
on high end, uh, sometimes unique products uh, in, a, in a sense of the, the, uh, the fact that you're getting something better when you go to AJ's than you would in going into uh, Food City or, or, uh, or Target's Market or uh, uh, Sam's Club or any place else. So their target market is generally high end income, and that drives a number of things. Those, the, the value proposition in their target market for AJ's. Uh, it drives where they're located. It drives the fact that they generally will have smaller stores and a heavy emphasis on customer service. Uh, the marketing is around the premium quality of all of those uh, and a prestige that is associated with buying those, kind of upper, uh, those kinds of products. On the other side, uh, it's kind of the opposite for Food City. They generally are located uh, near low income communities for lots of reasons, including the fact that low income communities perhaps don't have uh, as great a transportation uh, options as others. And so therefore they wanna be located close to their customers. They drive larger stores because they need high volume and they emphasize low cost. That is their primary uh, focus on the target market, uh, the low to moderate income customers. So this actually is the business model canvas. Uh, we're gonna go through in at least a little bit of detail on each of the blocks within the canvas, but the way that this thing is structured so that it is visual and kind of shows you what are the key elements of virtually any business. Um, the, that you, and uh, the two blocks that you will want to focus on most, we'll talk about here in a moment, uh, that is the value proposition of whatever product or service it is that your business provides. And that is only relevant in terms of the customer segments, the, the far right block, uh, that is only relevant in terms of the customer segments that you're actually going after. So the value proposition has to be in, in terms of what the customers want out of your product or service. And we'll talk uh, as we kind of go through, through each of these, as uh, each of the blocks to uh, indicate what, how they kind of serve the idea of of defining your business. So it asks a couple of the key questions here. This is kind of the simplistic view of this. Uh, and you'll notice the numbers down there um, at the, in each of these, these blocks for this simple diagram indicates you start a little differently. You don't go from right or rather from left to right like you normally read in terms of filling out these blocks. You start with the two most important ones. Normally, you will start with the value proposition, which really defines what it is you are delivering and what it is that uniquely you are going to, uh, to be providing to the customer segment, which is the second block that you will go to. And it is highly important to get those two right. If you really don't get the linkage between your value proposition and your customer segment, if you don't get that right in understanding what your customers truly want out of your product or service, um, your, your business is destined to fail. There's really nothing else that you can do with any of the other blocks to make up the differential between the fact that you must get the customer to actually want what it is that you have. Now, you, you notice I said want, uh, it's need or want, Need and want is better. Uh, need comes before want, obviously, but you don't necessarily have to have a customer that needs what you offer. Uh, want is sometimes sufficient. If you look at, for example, I pick on BMWs all the time. The reality is nobody needs a BMW. A BMW essentially uh, is a vehicle that gets you from point A to point B, Sometimes, sometimes uh, you may consider it does that in better style, but in terms of needing a BMW, you don't need that. Especially if you're out on the 10, you're not gonna be going any faster than someone in a Chevy or a Honda. Uh, and so 
you can sell a product based solely on the fact that a customer wants it as opposed to the fact that a customer must need and want it. It's actually better if you can get both, but you can certainly sell on one alone. So if you go through the rest of the, uh, the canvas there, you can kind of see how the numbers indicate and sort of make uh, put in uh, uh, sort of simple English terms what those blocks are all about in terms of uh, how you structure your business. So let's look at a, um, a fair, uh, something all of us are familiar with and look at how uh, McDonald's might fill out the, uh, the canvas. Uh, in their value proposition, uh, and you can have obviously more than one value proposition. And here it just says quick and expensive meal, but we all kind of know that there's more to it than that, especially any of you who uh, have kids out there. Uh, kids usually like to go to McDonald's and it's really not so much in many cases, the food at McDonald's, the fact that it, that, that it attracts them. Uh, a significant portion of the, uh, the draw for kids to go to McDonald's is they wanna to go to the play place and have fun and that sort of thing. So that becomes part of the value proposition that, it, uh, that McDonald's serves as well. For, so when you drop over to that first of the customer segment uh, part of the canvas, you'll see the first thing that it leads there with is families. Uh, that's where the kids come in, uh, dragging you into McDonald's when perhaps you might want to go someplace else because they really want to go to the play place. Uh, it also serves, of course, on a great deal of the other public uh, out there, uh, workers. It's a, it is a quick and it's an inexpensive meal. And so obviously uh, a lot of working folks uh, uh, take a quick break to go to McDonald's for lunch. It's a, uh, and it, it actually serves a senior population very well. Uh, those of you who uh, have happened to have gone into McDonald's in the, uh, uh, earlier in the day might have seen that a uh, significant portion of our senior population uh, kind of maybe used McDonald's as a, a gathering place, at least before COVID, you know, got so uh, kind of knocked us out of that. But they would kind of just gather in the morning for uh, to have coffee there, rather than a more expensive coffee place like uh, going to Starbucks. So um, when you drop over to the distribution channels, uh, you, obviously McDonald's generally had been uh, focusing on the actual in-store delivery of their products. They've had to modify themselves a little bit and actually go to delivery on some of this uh, under COVID. But generally speaking, under normal circumstances, you actually go physically to the store and, uh, and uh, go through the drive-through if you like, but also the main thing is to actually go into the store uh, and uh, have, uh, have a McDonald's meal. The customer relationships, face-to-face -face is service, and, and part of the customer relationship there is big on marketing and advertising uh, to get people to come in. Uh, so there again, they focus on service uh, as well as the quality of the food that they provide, but service is a big deal with regard to having you come back as a customer. Uh, if you go over and look at key activities, uh, Marketing and advertising is a big deal. Uh, well, all of us who watch a little TV, you certainly can't go too terribly long, usually before you see the McDonald's commercial. McDonald's is big on staffing and training uh, in order to essentially uh, get the, the, the fact that you will expect the same kind of meal uh, wherever you go in, in McDonald's, no matter where it is in the country, you will generally get pretty much the same thing. There's a lot of staffing and training about making sure that that happens. Their key resources are employees uh, and the locations. McDonald's is a, uh, a big real estate conglomerate and spend a significant amount of effort determining exactly where McDonald's will be most effective in terms of putting up a, uh, a new location. Their strategic partners on the other, on the other hand uh, are uh, their franchises. McDonald's is primarily a franchise company. There are some 
uh, McDonald's corporately owned stores, but the vast majority of McDonald's stores that you see out there are owned by franchisees. And so therefore, uh, it is important that McDonald's works with them properly to make sure that there is a uh, what's in it for them on both sides for both McDonald's corporate and the franchisees. Underlying all of this, of course, are how McDonald's drives revenues, the corporate store sales, uh, the royalties they collect from the uh, franchisees. Uh, and against that, you put the various costs that are associated with, with uh, delivering all of those elements. And you then come up with the idea of whether uh, the franchisees are making money and whether uh, McDonald's corporate is making money as well. So we're gonna talk about how that sort of all fits together for those building blocks. So the value proposition, as we've talked about for just a little bit, what value you're offering the customers, what it's gonna do for them, and what needs and here wants do you satisfy? They mentioned a, a few of these. Uh, the key question here is understanding whether they actually, your, your target customers care what they care about amongst all of those various things that you might offer uh, in your value proposition. Value proposition normally includes cost, but one of the reasons why we haven't sort of talked about that as primary here is that cost, uh, the cost value proposition is usually not the driver uh, for a lot of businesses. Uh, going in it, into it with the idea that low cost is the only thing that customers want is usually not a winning strategy. So on the customer segments, understanding uh, what customers you're serving. Uh, and then one of the key things about uh, the cost element there is how much they want what it is that you're providing. And they, the how much they want actually is translated into how much they're willing to pay for it. So understanding that for the one or multiple customer segments that you are offering is absolutely key to your business. Those are, that really is the core of your business. The rest of it is essentially involved, the rest of the model is really involved with how you wind up delivering that. So talking about delivering, uh, delivering your products or services. I mean, there are various ways of doing that. Of course, we mentioned in the McDonald's model, usually that, or if you're a restaurant, uh, normally that is you have a uh, brick and mortar place of business and customers are coming to that space to actually enjoy your food. There are obviously other uh, businesses out there that deliver value uh, over the web or deliver a value by shipping it uh, through uh, Amazon or Amazon packaging or the postal service there. So how you deliver your customer, your products and services to your customers uh, are important. Uh, the fact that we are under this COVID circumstance means that a number of uh, organizations and companies out there have had to rethink some of that and have had to look at the idea as to whether the, the way they have normally done business uh, was something that could be expanded. And so that they're delivering things exactly as we are today. This is a, uh, we've, we've done the uh, webinars before, but our primary delivery on these kinds of workshops used to be in person. Uh, and we hope to get back to that again but right now, we have primarily shifted to the idea that we must do this over the web. So the relationships that we're talking about with uh, each customer segment, that part, of that part of that is that marketing relationship, the sales and support relationships. Uh, you need to understand strongly what your, how your customers essentially want to be contacted. What do they, how, what do they expect from you and what can you draw back from them? As I'm sure all of you are pretty well aware, uh, the best kind of relationship you can have with a customer is essentially one that is mentioned in the last word on the slide, that is a retentive relationship. 
repeat customers are so much easier than getting new customers. But in certain kinds of businesses, uh, new customers may be very important. Even if you're a McDonald's, for example, if you're located along a, uh, a major interstate, uh, one of the sets of customers that uh, show up in, at your McDonald's uh, are people who are driving by, going from city to city, and may never see your McDonald's again. But you want to be able to, uh, to reach those, and normally you'll reach those by having signs on the highway, having the, uh, the big tall McDonald's sign so that they can see it, so that before they get to that exit, they can pull off. You need to understand how you're going to be acquiring that customer, and if it's a customer from which you expect repeat business, how you're going to attempt to retain that customer. So the revenue streams, uh, again, on the right side of the model, what value? Uh, what are customers willing to pay for the products and services that you are uh, providing? And here you're usually heavily into a competition uh, analysis to understand who else out there might be providing similar, customer, uh, similar products and services. Uh, and looking at the idea of whether your, uh, what you're doing is at least cost competitive. It doesn't necessarily need to be uh, lower than what they're doing. Maybe what you're pushing is the fact that you're going to be higher quality. And in fact, the reality is sometimes it doesn't have to be uh, even competitive in terms of the same. Uh, as I mentioned, BMW doesn't sell their vehicles. In fact, they don't, they don't even call them vehicles or cars. They call them ultimate driving machines. And the reason for that is that they custom, their customers expect to pay a premium price for that vehicle as opposed to a Chevy or Ford or a Honda. So you understand basically how you're generating uh, transactional or recurring revenues. And really, when you go through that process, you look at the full spectrum. Uh, sometimes it's a, for example, if you're selling uh, certain kinds of things, uh, your revenue stream in selling the original product may be less important than, in terms of the profit you make on it than the uh, stream of revenue that you get from servicing that product. So truly understanding what those revenue streams should be and, and how big a part they play in the total revenue you expect to derive is absolutely important. So the resources that underpin the business model, you clearly have to understand that to understand what it is you need to, uh, to do the create part of the model, to create the, the services that you uh, uh, services or products that you are uh, offering. Uh, and then understanding which activities and, and when you're going through this, you really want to prioritize that. Uh, there are certain activities that drive the uh, capability of your business more than others. And so if you're, you can just have a sort of a, a checklist uh, that's all where everything is the same priority, you're probably not going to be as effective as if you have identified those which derive the most value into the creation and delivery of the uh, products and services that you're looking for. And none of us have infinite time and resources. And so that certainly gets to the point of uh, how you manage those resources to make sure that you are properly allocating them against the activities you need to perform well. And then this may or may not be relevant to your particular business, that is uh, partners and suppliers. And understand that there is a significant difference between those two. Uh, sometimes people are pretty loose with the term partner uh, with, uh, in uh, talking about people who are engaged with their business. And there is a very specific business definition of that that you need to be cognizant of because it is meaningful in terms of how you interact with them. Uh, a partner and a supplier are two different things. You may have very important suppliers 
but in many cases, the suppliers uh, are not partnered with you simply because they supply everyone equally. Uh, when you're dealing with a partner, it has to be something that is mutual. It has to be something in which you both derive something uh, that is of meaningful value from the relationship itself, not just the fact that uh, I, as a supplier, am selling you whatever it is that you need for your business. And then, of course, the cost structure uh, is looking at the idea of all those activities that you're doing uh, and the resources that you have. What are the costs associated with that in order to produce those products and services? Uh, looking at the key elements that drive the cost. Again, it's important as a, uh, as a manager of your business and owner of your business that you understand those uh, because in many cases, there are situations in which you're going to uh, have to manage those differently depending on circumstances like we're dealing with today. So one of the things you absolutely must do, uh, and this is relevant for both uh, brand new businesses for startups and relevant as you go and you're managing uh, a business that's been in place for a while. And it's particularly relevant today because of course, with all the changes that have happened or and will be happening with regard to uh, dealing with this COVID situation, uh, things are your assumptions that you went into or, and were operating on as a business may have changed. And so you need to go back and take a look at that again. So one of the ways you test your model is you start with research. And uh, the internet is absolutely invaluable in terms of the amount of data that's out there and, and even analysis that's out there if you ask the questions properly to, uh, to figure out exactly where your business is going to fit into the business uh, ecosphere out there uh, and how it's going to successfully compete against competition. Uh, I've sometimes heard from clients, well, they're, they're, what I, my product is absolutely unique. And so there really is no competition. That is never true. At the very least, even if that is true with regard to the fact of the uniqueness of what it is you're going to offer, uh, you've got what I call pocketbook competition in the sense that none of us has uh, infinitely deep pockets. And so we're making decisions about things that we buy. And so in many cases, even though what you have is unique, it may have to display something else. I may have to decide not to buy something else that really has nothing to do with what you're offering, but yet that is a competition to your business because you're competing for the same dollars. So second thing is direct contact. Uh, if you in fact can talk to people who are running similar businesses, that's also a great way to validate a number of the uh, assumptions that you have that you've either gained through experience or that or you've gained through research. Uh, third way is crowdfunding. Uh, this is uh, not all that common, but it certainly can be used for certain kinds of products that uh, you can actually raise capital with crowdfunding and at the same time validate whether there is a, uh, there is a, a demand for that particular product. I use this particular, uh, this coolest cooler, uh, and then I'd recommend to you, it'd be interesting for you if you're interested in, in the idea of looking at uh, how business ideas um, can be successful or not. This is a, a, great, a great example. Uh, this was the second largest product our uh, uh, product raised for capital on kick, Kickstarter, uh, $13 million. Yet this actually wound up being a business failure. And I won't go into the detail of that because it's a, a long uh, cycle in terms of, of establishing expectations, operating sort of out ahead of your headlights uh, and uh, the way things kind of break in the business world. But they had a tremendously successful start in getting this coolest cooler started uh, and certainly validated a demand if they raised $13 million on Kickstarter. But uh, 
there are factors that came in that uh, kind of blew this out of the water and it wound up being an unsuccessful product in the end. So talking about testing, you, interviews is one of the ways that you can test. Uh, and there's some interview tools out there uh, like uh, uh, using SurveyMonkey and other kinds of things, but even in the context of talking to people about uh, your product, you kind of look at that as an interview. And so you bring the right attitude to that. You're really seeking knowledge. One of the things you clearly don't want to do is use the interview as a sales tool, because what you want to do is you want to get unbiased opinions as much as you possibly can about whether in fact your product uh, is viable uh, for the customer set that you're putting, uh, putting out there. You definitely listen more than you talk. And you listen, uh, as it says here, with a fresh pair of ears. It, in, and uh, avoiding inventor's bias is the idea of making sure that you don't discount what people are saying simply because you're in love with your uh, product, service, or solution so much that you are unwilling to listen to criticism. The process of creating a profile, sketching out the characteristics, uh, an interview outline, and then going through the uh, interview itself. We'll talk a little bit about what some of the things you do that, that you, uh, in terms of uh, creating a good interview. Uh, again, it's not about selling. Uh, you stay, out, stay away from the idea of mentioning solutions early in the game. Uh, what you clearly don't do is say, uh, our solution does X, Y, and Z. Would you like some of that? Uh, the, the question to ask is, what are your problems that you're working with? And then look at the idea in your analysis phase, how your solution deals with those important problems. Uh, follow up, as it indicates, and then open doors at the end, that is open-ended questions Ask who else could I, could, I, uh, could I talk to. Focus on usable answers. Uh, again, don't go to the idea of I have a widget that is red and is so high, would you like one of those? Uh, go back to the idea of understanding the problem as, as seen by the user, by, by your prospective customer, not as you see it understand how they will perceive it, uh, ask how much, they, how much they actually need or want to solve that problem. If, it's a, if, they, if you simply ask whether they have the problem, they may answer yes. But if it's a very minor problem, then they're not gonna actually spend much, if anything, to actually solve it. So you ask basically, what, how much would you pay to solve that problem is part of the interview. And then ask, uh, sort of why questions to get the motivations as to why they think that is a particular problem for them. In, in evaluating the interview results, you look for patterns, look, what, look for what stands out, uh, look at what is common across the, uh, the interviewees that you're working with, uh, look at the context in which they're operating, and then you basically kind of implement what you learn. And this is a cyclical process. You don't necessarily do just one interview and uh, figure you've got it all down. And this is not something you do only at the start of your business process. This is something that you do uh, even for an op a business that's been operating for years. It is useful to go back and interview customers. And some one of the questions that, that's interesting to ask is ask a customer, a even a good customer, why did you buy my product or service? Uh, sometimes you will get the an, an answer back that you don't expect. You thought they bought because of a particular, maybe you thought they bought because of price, or maybe you thought they bought because you touted high quality, and you may get an answer back that's different. And it can change the way you think about how you are going to both present or change your product or services. So again, back to the idea of sort of the uh, standard, simple English uh, idea about what the business model canvas does for you. 
and go to the bottom line here with regard of why it is something that you want to use. You really want to use this document to create that, that critical path so that you understand that you have validated your concept of what the customer wants. Uh, you can use this as a, uh, for communication, as I indicated. Uh, you can kind of use this if you, if you actually need to write a business plan. I, I normally uh, ask my clients, do this first, and it will actually help you to write a better business plan if you have gotten this down properly. Uh, and it actually, as I indicated there, uh, is, uh, is a strong base to add that information. Uh, if you need the business plan, as I mentioned, there are some cases in the case of uh, a bank, for example, that, that will, uh, they will normally accept a business model canvas as an additional communication with them but they may require the standard business plan uh, as part of their standard loan package. So I'm gonna give you a couple of references and uh, I should mention that um, the uh, ACA will send to all of you who are on the, uh, on the uh, conference today, uh, a copy of the slides. And uh, they will also send you a, uh, a copy of a Word document that actually is the business model canvas. And that Word document is something you can use to actually type into that, those dot points that I talked about. When you're typing in those dot points that go into each of the blocks, you can use that Word document uh, as your working template to, uh, to capture that. So I'm going to recommend a couple of YouTube video references. There are actually, oh, I can't even imagine how many, what the number is of um, YouTube um, videos are out there on, on the Business Model Canvas. But these are a couple that I think are particularly useful. If you just go into your whatever, Google or whatever and uh, type in secret process of today's successful ventures, it will take you to a, uh, a production done by a company called Strategizer. It's a six video series on building a business plan using business model canvas, but don't let that scare you because there are very short little videos and the, and the whole six video series is only about 20, maybe 21 minutes. Uh, and the second one I'll give you is a little different because it is, uh, it's called Capture Your Business Plan in 20 Minutes by a guy named Ash Maria. And it, it's actually a tutorial on something that was derived from the business model canvas, but it actually is something called the lean canvas. It is similar, the blocks are a little bit different, and I provide that to you simply so that you can take a look at it. You may decide to use that uh, instead of the business model canvas itself. It is a variation. Uh, it, it has a couple of different things in terms of how they've set up the blocks, but you may find that to be useful as well. Some people do in terms of uh, using this instead of business model canvas, but yeah, business model canvas was the original from which this was derived and it does the same kind of things for you. So uh, with that, that's kind of the overview of Business Model Canvas. Uh, if you can use some help working on yours, certainly we, that is SCORE, are available. Here in the uh, Phoenix area, we've got about 67, I think, of us last number I looked at. And across the country, we've got uh, over 10,000 of us uh, who are mentors within uh, SCORE and can help you with any number of things around uh, your business. But one of the things we can do is to help you think through how the Canvas applies to your business. So you can do that. Uh, we do other workshops aside from this. Uh, most of them on, in fact, virtually all of them online now, but eventually we did that we'll be back to uh, in-person workshops here in the Phoenix area and other, other areas around the country. Uh, you can look for those uh, 
for filling in gaps in your skills and knowledge and business. Uh, and of course, the last thing there is the contact number uh, for Greater Phoenix Score and uh, the uh, contact uh, website as well uh, to where you can essentially make an appointment, in this case, a virtual appointment with one of our mentors. So with that, if you have any questions, I will be happy to address those for you. All right, thank you, Jay. Uh, great presentation. Uh, so attendees, if you have questions for Jay, please uh, post those up in the uh, Q&A box um, or in the chat. We can do it in either one. Um, a note for SCORE. SCORE is a no-cost business resource. Uh, their, their mentors do the no-cost counseling um, and they are supported. Uh, they are partnered with the Small Business Administration as well. Um, so they, they are a great resource uh, throughout the community. Um, and they do have a Northern Arizona chapter and a Southern Arizona chapter as well. All right, well, it looks like we don't have any questions right now. Okay. Um, we uh, have a few minutes left, but we can always wrap up early, give the people a few minutes back in the day. Jay, any last you know, parting thoughts uh, for today's session? Well, I think uh, uh, the main session in terms of what we're doing right now is that with everything that is changing during uh, the, the COVID-19, there, there are tremendous impacts on all kinds of um, businesses. The competition is going to be different. Uh, we're obviously seeing a significant impact on businesses uh, that are no longer going to be there. So even if you're a business that is in business and has been in business for quite some period of time, it is worthwhile to kind of go back to the drawing board here to understand how you're going to interact with your customers. Maybe It may be different. It may be the same, but you want to be intentional about making that decision rather than just stumbling in through it, into it uh, based on uh, not, not doing that analysis. Excellent. Thank you, Jay. We did have one question pop up uh, from Michael. It says, uh, referring to SCORE, are there subsequent mentorship fees? Um, my understanding is there is not, uh, that uh, SCORE is a, all our services, all their mentoring is no cost. Some of their training classes do have minimal costs um, to help provide, you know, the facilities and so forth when they do face-to-face -face, uh, sessions um, and some of the live sessions but uh, their counseling their business counseling and mentoring is no cost that is absolutely true i have clients i've worked with for years and uh the first session was free and the 101st session was free yeah. excellent well jay thank you for your time this morning uh, it's been excellent i uh, really appreciate uh, the details in the session in the session about that business model canvas and the interviewing uh, great tips on interviewing that's a that was exciting to see that um, so thank you. We appreciate your time. We appreciate the partnership with SCORE and, and supporting the boot camp. Um, and for all the attendees, just want to give you a reminder of Friday session, 9 a.m. Uh, you can register for that on the boot camp website. And until then, everybody have a great week and we'll see you on Friday morning. Thank, thank you. you Robert.